and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from the lands of Scribbles and Dice, creator of the Forged in the Dark um, base, ga base game Shatterkin Evolution, along with some other projects which we'll, ho which we'll hopefully get to down the line. The one and only, don't call him Scotty because he ain't beaming you up, Scott Kramer. How you doing today, man? I'm doing good. And yes, d don't call me Scotty. Thank you. <laughs> I I figured I figured you hear the Scotty joke en enough times, so I'd head that off at the pass. Well, th thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I'm I'm excited about this. Mm -hmm. So, a bit of a tradition is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. And with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh man, okay. So my first introduction to role-playing games was it, it was it was a a long and 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 arduous path I, I I tread of of wanting to get into this mysterious role-playing game scene uh, that always seems too far away. Um, I in in uh, you know I, I didn't really hear about it until I was in uh, middle school or junior high, uh, and there was there was uh, you know I met a couple people that had this Dungeons and Dragons, and I I'm like I I've heard the word I don't know what it is, and and I kind of got the pitch and thought oh man this sounds so cool I got to get into that, but like I could you know they they're like oh yeah yeah come play with me sometime, and then like never actually did. Uh, um, I don't know. Maybe they they weren't sincere about their uh, invitation to come play the game or whatnot. I don't know. So I, I I spent you know like two to three years of like trying to get into RPGs and never finding anyone that wanted to play. Meanwhile, I was you know I was playing plenty of board games and just about treating them like RPGs. You know, like I, I didn't know what I was missing to not make it you know, to, that, that separated it from an RPG. But uh, I hope to God um, you weren't doing that with Monopoly. No, no, no. We 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 had a well, we had um, Hero Quest. Uh, if you're familiar, an old oh yes, Milton Bradley that was very I don't know Warhammer inspired, and you know, well, Games Workshop um, co-produced the original version. Oh. It was a it was a collab with that with them, and I think um, I think it was I think it was Milton Bradley at the time that 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 uh, co so. That's so. That's where the Warhammer DNA comes from. Is the fact that Games Workshop oh. was working on it. It was one of those rare times when they actually when they actually knew how to play well with others. Yeah, that is uh, that is a rare occasion. Um, so yeah, we had a copy of that that I believe actually my brother picked it up at a thrift store. In it was in pretty good condition, and the story I heard later was that he had actually taken like a two dollar sticker off another item and put it on there over like the twenty dollar sticker and uh you know so our our copy of hero quest was only kind of legally purchased uh but anyhow uh so that kind of you know i i kind of role played a little when i played that but didn't know what made it different from a tabletop role-playing game what made it different from D D. maybe if i pursued that further it would have been just as good of an rpg who knows well i don't know um, but then finally, what got me into role playing games officially the, the 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 first real step I took was uh through the role playing game uh the riddle of steel uh if you're familiar with that one at all it was yes i yes i am i um not to toot my own horn, but I covered two spiritual successors to that ga to that game a few years ago oh really that's great yeah uh it was great. I loved that game. It was full of flaws looking back. It was it was it was messy, but as as the introduction to role playing games for me. So at that point I still hadn't played D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, uh it so which I think that shaped my approach to role playing games uh for the rest of my life here is like my first RPG was a very indie RPG um and that kind of I I honestly didn't really play Dungeons and Dragons until like uh seven or eight years later um but yeah we got into the riddle of steel you know excited by this 
promise of a realistic combat system where you're chopping off people's arms and, and chopping off people's legs. You'd lose your legs a lot. Don't forget leg armor in that game. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. And we, we almost never followed all the rules. I'm pretty sure. Like there was a whole chapter that I skipped on like these maneuvers and techniques. Cause the combat system was robust enough already. Anyway, I thought, but so we played that a bunch and then we tried to hack that a bunch. You know, we were making our own settings. We tried to, to hack it with Warcraft, uh, play some, <laughs> some of the riddle of steel fighting against the burning legion. Uh, and uh, played that for quite, honestly five or six years before I got any other RPGs. Um, and then from there, like I bought a couple other RPGs, and then just like that was like the slippery slope that turned into a shelf of thirty to forty RPGs. Uh, and 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 yeah, so I don't know. That's my where where my role playing game beginnings began. Mm-hmm. Um. It is in, it is interesting that um, that you ended up taking such a roundabout path towards um, tabletop because I honestly uh, I could see some re- some remarking that D- that um you start you starting outside of D and D first is some kind of detriment. I don't think it is because nah. it, it mean it um. It means that you're able to get the idea of what a role playing game is without having to deal with the tradition problem, which is something that I've talked about in one form or another o- over the pa- over the past few years. <clears throat> um, yeah. But would it? But given the, given that kind of history, would it be fair of me to say that you're somebody who jumped around between a bunch of different systems over the years? Oh yes, uh, definitely have. <laughs> um. Definitely. Uh, let's like, I, you know, like I said, I started with the real steel. I tried out, uh, I, I, I jumped, I latched onto the, uh, fantasy flight games, uh, company and, and their, their products for quite a while. So I played, I got started with them with a game called fireborn. I've, uh, I've got that. Yeah. And then, then from there got into their Warhammer line with a uh, rogue trader. Um, I've also played some legend of the five rings, which, at the, well, at the back then they didn't own that one, hmm. and uh, but uh, but then from there, like I don't know, I I've played, I don't know, I don't want to list everything I've played because there's there's a lot more, but yeah. uh, along the way, I, I I've I've with ever especially early on, like I I jumped right into trying to make my own games too, and and some of my first ones were really rough, and, and looking back at them, they're they're best left in an unopened document on my computer. Um, but uh, so it's, it's, it's always a mix of like playing random games I made or m- hacked off of another game and then trying out the newest thing, whatever it was for me. Uh, usually I was pursuing like the, an intellectual property or just general, general theme that I liked. Like uh, I got really big into the Mistborn uh, role-playing game. Uh, based on the novels by Brandon Sanderson. Um, and then, like I said, I got into the Warhammer ones because I, I, I took that step into the Warhammer uh, genre setting, intellectual property, whatever we call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, then in more recent years, I've, I've, I've done a lot more like playing one shots of games. And that's where I ended up getting, you know, one shots of games like Delta green or, the Dragon Age role playing game, the uh, some Powered by the Apocalypse games like uh, Monster of the Week and Legacy, um, Legacy Life Among the Ruins, I think was yep. it. Um, uh, good, good stuff, good stuff. And that that brings me to a question of since w- with all of the ones you've mentioned, um, now Shatterkin is uses the framework of um, Forged in the Dark the basically the SRD of um, Blades in the Dark. How did you how did you first come across um, Blades and in a wider scope, how did you first come across um, Powered by the Apocalypse since the two of them kind of have a symbiotic relationship with each other? Yeah, uh, so I'd, I'd been, you know, looking for various like game design podcasts and RPG themed 
media to consume. Uh, and uh, and so I started hearing Powered by the Apocalypse thrown around in a lot of these. And, and, and you know, was interested in checking those out, but I but hadn't really yet. And then um, when I was looking for advice on how to write a good GM section in a book, in, in an RPG, uh, because that's that's a tough part. The GM section can be utterly useless or it can really change the game for you. Um, and so I was really struggling to figure out how to write one. And and somebody recommended it was uh, the, the, that I check out Blades in the Dark's GM section. Mm -hmm. So not knowing anything about Blades in the Dark, I, I bought the the digital copy of it and 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 jumped right to the the GM section. Didn't look at anything else. Didn't know what the game was. Just reading this GM section and the GM said, you know, so so a lot of what I read, I'm like, ah, what's what's it talking about? Because it was referring back to stuff that's in the game. And so I'm like, okay, I got I got to slow down and go back and read it. And then didn't put it down until I'd gotten through almost the whole book in one sitting. And I'm like, I've got to play this game. Uh, and and I did shortly thereafter ran a ran a pretty fun campaign and from there i was just like i love this system it is maybe my favorite system and i've got to play more of it now with and with that with that in mind what what was it what was it about um about about powered by the apocalypse that you that um or rather not powered by the apocalypse but blades in the dark specifically that um was a stick was a point of sticking uh, for me, I think the biggest thing was just the the fact that no dice roll had an outcome of nothing happens. Um, you know, like the and that that most dice rolls weren't just you got the good thing and only the good thing. Like I loved that it was broken down into either yes, you succeeded at your thing if you rolled the six, or on a four to five, you succeed at your thing, but something bad happens, and then. Uh, Eventually, that could be the case if all your consequence was was that you lose the opportunity to do what you're doing. But but I I, I don't know if I just overlooked that that was an option or not. But the first time the first the whole campaign that I did, every action that had to have something happen had to have the story move forward and change. And I absolutely love that because um, there's nothing more boring than when you get an RPG where everybody's failing their role and the story doesn't move forward. I'd rather a game where the f when everyone fails their role, the game moves forward just in a terrible direction, and that's what this was. And that's what that's what really got my attention first. Um, what I really liked the most. Yeah. Other facets of the game, game uh, are great too. Like I love the stress mechanics and the traumas and the the way that the devil's bargain works and uh, the way that the abilities were very you know while some of them all had some kind of mechanical benefit there was a lot of narrative benefit to them all um all of those were things that really drew me in but but i think the first big one was that dice mechanic mm -hmm. now that brings that brings me to Sh to um shatterkin which i will ad i will admit that um when i the my path to discovering shatterkin was when i was asking was when i was asking around about some um, because I was I was writing I was writing a overview of um, of Digimon Digital Adventures, and in one of the threads where I was asking if anybody else had tried a similar thing of em of emulating something similar to it, um, Shatterkin got brought up, and hmm. then I ended up I ended up doing my my own bit of digging, and the re and the rest is history. So the 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 um, question that the question that I have on that on that front is um. How how did the initial idea for something like Shatterkin come about? Uh, this is an idea that I've been I've been sitting on for years. Like I I watched Digimon back when it first aired in the what ninety nine or two thousand or whenever that was. I don't know, mm -hmm. and I loved it. I I was real hooked. Uh, I don't know something about cool evolving monster pets just gets me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as I've worked on making games just for fun over the years, like that had always been one on my mind. Like I want to be able to play that. I want to be able to play a game where I've got a cool evolving monster pet. And, and I thought of like different ways I wanted to do it. I tried, you know, I've got, I've got, you know, just like kind of rough design idea, brainstorming documents where I've outlined how I could do it as a, as a tabletop 
a board game or a, like a tactical war game even and all these and and you know how could I use it in a different RPG system? And, 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 and it never really clicked. It never, none of them were things I really pursued very much. And they always hit dead ends. Um, but then I, after playing the blaze in the dark and seeing that, you know, they had this whole SRD for creating your own forged in the dark games. I was like, Hey, maybe I could, maybe I could work that into my, uh, Digimon inspired RPG idea, and I, you know, started playing around with some like what what, what would it amount to, you know, what how would the different mechanics transfer over, mm-hmm. and I, uh, I, you know, it all started to click as I as I saw ways. Oh, stress could be the the trust between your kid and their monster, and and uh, the different. You know, I could use a clock to see how when you're going to evolve and mm-hmm. and things like that, and it just all kind of came together pretty quickly. And I I don't know that, that's where that's where it started. I guess that's how I got to that point. Now, when it, when I was lo- when I was looking into it, because like like I said, the the idea of bringing Digimon to tabletop is something I've seen um, a few people do. Digital Adventures is one of the big is one of the more well-known ones, but there was also a um, a D twenty based attempt called Digital Encounters. Um, but with a lot of them, they're f- with a lot of them, they're focused on the uh, on the going into the digital world kind of thing. The same the way the way it was in in a majority of the series, especially say um, especially say Adve- Ad- Adventure and um, and Frontier. Um, but in your case, you you went with you went with the uh, the other side the other side of it, and the one th- the one th- the one um season that I keep getting reminded of as I as I looked through Shatterkin was season three, better known as Tamers. Was that the more direct influence, or is that um, coincidence on my part? on it still persisted even without watching the show so i never have watched season three and i have no idea what it's about or that i didn't know that so yes coincidence <laughs> uh, i guess that it that was going on there um i think i think more of it was uh i think uh the the stranger things uh, the Netflix show had, uh, had, had come out a year or two before I made Shatterkin. And mm-hmm. I was just like, oh man, I want to do that. Little kids running around town dealing with cool things. Um, and I'm like, well, well, and I also want to do little kids with monster pets. Maybe I'll mash them together. Um, and that's, so that's kind of, that's what I did, uh, with it. That's where it kind of came together. Originally, it was going to be, I was I was gonna I was gonna add in a few more elements of of having it be like an it was gonna be an alternate history in the sixties where the Cold War was being fought with you know these evolving monsters and uh, I eventually dropped that because I didn't want to do adequate research into the Cold War to make it feel authentic ish. You're, um, you're also reminding me way too much of Godlike, and I'm not sure if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, uh, probably not. That's uh, uh, I'm not entirely familiar with that one. I know I've heard the name. Oh. Is that that's not related to? That's not like a Cthulhu thing, is it? No, no. Um, okay. God, Godlike, what Godlike is the is the um, con- is the continuity prequel to Wild Talents, both of them by Arc Dream and both of them using the one roll engine. Um, okay. Godlike is just doing superheroes actually being in World War Two. Oh. Interesting. That, now granted that is a vast simplification of <laughs> that particular set that particular setup. But since you since you mentioned the that you had considered the idea of Shatterkin in the nineteen sixties, that's what immediately came to came to mind is God like trying to fully explore the consequences of of superpowered beings 
um, first appearing in World War II and then in the wars afterwards. Hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. I'll have to check it out. But but yeah, it it, it would have been it would have been significantly different from that. But but even then, I I didn't I dropped the alternate history route and and just said let's just throw it into the nineties nondescript nineties kids town. It, it could be any town kind of place. Small town kids Man. having fun with their monster pets and if left this, it. If this was a Stephen King script, it would have been yeah. written in Maine. <laughs> Probably. Probably, like uh, that's the that's the first shot in the Stephen King drinking game. Absolutely, I will note I do not endorse anyone trying to do the Stephen King drinking game, and if you do, I take no responsibility for what happens. Up to an include up to an including uh, having way too much drink. Now, one of the things that one of the things I find interesting that I noticed when I looked at the um, play sheets that I don't that I don't see in most play sheets. Period. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure if I dug deep enough, there might be one or two exceptions. But um, I I need about five about five more pot five more pots of coffee before I do that, and I'm not a coffee drinker. Is the card? <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh... There's there's a, a a lot out there. Yeah, is the card integration that you ha that you have on the pl on the play sheets in ref in reflection of fo of forms heir heirlooms and um, birthrights was yeah. that, was that it was what ins what inspired you to t to go to go with that route when it came to the play sheet design was that a artifact of your of your time with a lot of role play leaning board games. Uh, you know, I mean, that probably influenced it, but it, it was definitely just a, a more out of necessity. Uh, I wanted to to make sure that it was a one sided page, right? Like you didn't have to flip it back and forth. And I, I worked on the layout for quite a while, trying to figure out how can I fit all your different forms and their abilities onto a single page. Uh, and it just, it wasn't working. And, and especially since I know, I, I knew I wanted there to be branching evolution paths. So it's like, I can't have one page that's got 35 forms on it. Uh, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, and so cards just was the logical solution for me that, mm -hmm. Hey, you put all of your evolution stuff onto cards that way you can, you know, put them down on the, on, you know, next to your page or, you know, kind of got little slots at the bottom of the character sheet. Um, for you to put the put those cards when they're active, and when they're not active, when you've when you've uh re, you know ret re returned to your original forms, 
uh, you don't have all the cards out in front of you. You don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was just a, I feel like a, a really, the, the, the most effective solution for the necessities of, of, of the game. Mm-hmm. And that, that bring that before I, before I delve deep into, into some of the nitty gritty of Shatterkin, um, one thing that one thing that I sh- I feel needs to be made clear is the fact that this is still this is still using the um, the SRD of Bla- of Blades in the Dark. It's still using the framework of Blades in the Dark. Yes. And to that end, I'd be what I'm curious about is what is what mechanics you were you felt prudent to keep from Blades in the Dark, and what mechanics you felt that you're going to have to blow up. Um. That's a very good question. That's uh, the the biggest ones to keep was I mean I wanted to keep that core system with the core dice resolution like mm-hmm. like I uh, expressed earlier that my my big draw to that to the Blades in the Dark and its system was in the basic the 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 dice. Mm-hmm. Looking at other parts, uh, you know the I feel like the. The, the stress mechanics and, 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 and the economy surrounding stress, I thought that was important. I got to keep that. and mm-hmm. But I knew I had to change it. We don't want to be talking about stress when we're talking about little kids with, with evolving monster pets. We wanted something more thematic. Um, and and what I really liked about Digimon as, as, as the source inspiration, like there's other shows and other things that have evolving monster pets uh, and other, uh, you know, Pokemon, of course, is the big one there uh, that, that, that others might be more familiar with. Uh, but in, in in Digimon, it was so much more about like the relationship between the kids and their Digimon, right? That was that was central to it, and and I really wanted to capture that. And so when I was looking at what should I do with trust, uh, or sorry, what should I do with stress, turning it into trust was 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 the was the right solution that that came to me like i'm like that's that's that fits really well uh in in my opinion and 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 worked really well um but i had to keep that um i knew though of course you weren't going to get traumas out of it because again this is about little kids i don't want to give them trauma yet save that till they're older (laughs) uh well yeah i'm not going to go further there (laughs) (laughs) um but uh but but and so that I turned into their their rights and wrongs. You know, again, thinking back to the source inspiration here of Digimon, each each kid had a different, uh, you know, lesson that they were trying to learn. You know, and they had their at least thinking back to like the first season. Because again, I'm sorry, I failed. I didn't watch all the seasons. Um, <laughs> but in the first season, at least, you know, it was uh, before they could get to like their their big evolutions, their ultimate level, mega level, they had to have these critical learning moments where they learn courage or they learn friendship or they learn sincerity, etc. Uh and 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 so I wanted to bake that into the game. So that's where the the rights and wrongs came from, where your kid has got positive character traits but then some that come in as his wrongs that are his negative character traits and and the bond between your kid and their shatterkin is going to play a part in them building character and 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 turning those those negative traits they had into positive ones Mm -hmm. now when it came now when it came to when it came when it came to when it came to the 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 other thing that I find interesting with the she- with the play sheet setup is, in a lot of other, in a lot of games that have that have done this kind of thing, they tend to separate the hu- the human and the mon into separate character sheets, whereas you have combined them. In early drafts, was that the ca- was that the case, or was it so- or was it something that um that started out more traditional and then and then evolved through time. Um. So it it actually from the get go I had them as one sheet. Like I, I when I first started brainstorming for this game, I never made a rough draft of a a separate sheet for the kid. Um, but I'm gonna be uh, honest. I actually am working on uh, implementing some changes that will put the kid onto a separate sheet. Um, and I'm currently running a a, a campaign with some friends, playtesting 
some adjustments to the rules where uh, the kids and the monsters are a little more separated. They're going to still have the same stats on both sheets, like mm -hmm. as 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 your Shatterkin gains uh, different dots in their actions, the kids going to get the exact same ones. Um, so it's mostly a lot of the information on the kids sheet and the Shatterkin sheet are going to be the same uh, in the end. Uh, but part of why I put them on separate sheets is because uh, we're actually playtesting a, a, a variant of the rules where you don't play as your Shatterkin. Mm -hmm. uh, you play as your kid, and you hand your Shatterkin sheet over to another player. We, we kind of swoop. But it, it brought out a lot of really cool role playing elements that are that were lacking in previous playtests of the game. Mm -hmm. So that's why I actually now have a separate kid sheet. Uh, it's not released yet publicly. Um, I'm hoping to have that. That might be in a. I'm my. I'm not going to say any dates on recording. Can't. Uh, sometime in the future, I hope to have that released. All right. <laughs> now. When it come now, when it came now, one of the one of the interesting things with the um, evolution system that you have is that, as I understand it, um, you're doing um, hors you're doing horizontal and vertical um, forms of advancement. Yes, uh, I I wanted to have have a lot of variety mm -hmm. uh, to the different evolutions you could get, but but you know. It, it, you've got some practical limitations when it's in a tabletop game and that like how many abilities do you want to have to make how many car evolution cards do they want to have to print out uh so if i started to branch out and get too many forms and evolutions it it really would become a bird Big winged beast guy, or he could have a uh, um, the a primordial one, where he's now suddenly got a, an added elemental flavor to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we add into that the second set of lateral evolutions of a uh, your your heirloom, which would give you some kind of weapon, armor, artifact thing that your your shatterkin has, mm -hmm. and you get to mix and match those so with even more combinations. So so rather than just having you know five types of shatterkin that evolve into you know seven different forms each you now have combinations out the wazoo you know you've got i did i don't know i tried to do the math i'm not good at math but i think i came up with you can have over 1200 evolution varieties uh mm -hmm. with the ways you combine all of these yeah which is a lot more than the initial 35 mm -hmm. now when it comes now, when it comes to 
Obviously, obviously, since um, one of the key things with Blades in the Dark is the whole thing of doing jobs and ha and having a hideout. Um, I'm get I'm guessing that's refl that's reflected in things like the friends sheet. Um, yeah. But one one particular question that I have with that is, when it comes to the roster, there's one there there seems to be one entry for each um, Shatterkin type. Um, is the is the is the pref I'm not saying that the preferred approach is to is to have one of each type, but when it comes, but um, have you in playtesting had any instances where you had two players who had Shatterkin of the same type? Uh, yeah, so we actually, in our very first play test, um, because we only had four types of Shatterkin at the time, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we had a fifth player that wanted to join. And so, so sh she took on the same type as another kid. So we had, uh, two people using the avian type, the bird type, mm -hmm. and it worked out great because they, they chose kind of different evolution paths, um, and different, uh, the, you know, they took the different birthright and, and heirloom evolutions so that they could have, uh, quite a lot of variety. So while one person was running around with his like you know bird man samurai with angel feathers and mm -hmm. stuff uh, the other was running around with a a, a colossal demonic hellbird uh that was a very very different gameplay experience for both of them it worked out great demonic um, hellbird um are you sure they weren't just using a giant goose it, it was Okay, it may have been a goose in my. <laughs> but, uh, we we're, we're not sure about that. I'm just I'm just saying if you ever, you've had to deal you've had to deal with geese at least once you know how they can get. Oh oh absolutely I mean they're 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 at the top of the list for hellbirds. Mm -hmm. Um, now I, I will I will admit that one of the reasons why I um I ended up think I ended up thinking of of tamers when I was when I was looking at the setup had to deal with the um faction system that you have that you have when it comes to the crisis phase. Oh yeah. Cuz uh was just did the tamers feature some kind of factions or um in a in a sense yes. There were there were multiple factions er early on. Um and as thing as the as like like with a lot of cases, as the season went on, things got a little bit darker and a little bit more um, love a little bit more um, Lovecraftian in so, in some cases. <laughs> um, nice, because you you know how you know how it is with this, you know how it is with with this particular series. It see it seems it seems all cute and friendly, and then you get to the second half. <laughs> yeah, it gets a get a little more serious than than you'd expect. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm guessing that when even though you have a even though you have a set of factions, I'm guessing that you set it up so that it so that a so that you're not using a specific setting per se, but a se but a series of ideas that can be slotted in anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I I, I built you know the, the factions in the game is it's mostly those. Primarily the 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 kind of the big the syndicates, which are you know kind of just playing your big bad guys, because mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to you know if we're playing in a small town like in the real world, we want to have some kind of some, some kind of bad guy rather than just fighting other Shatterkin. Mm -hmm. um, and so we uh, so the, the the syndicates are the big you know big bad evil corporations that are trying to to use the Shatterkin for their own uh, needs, whether it's to try and weaponize them for the military or doing strange experiments on them um mm -hmm. so just you know i kind of put them together just to to be antagonists and the players could pick whichever they wanted or they could ignore them because you could also have the the wild chatterkin that are a problem to deal with or 
uh, or uh, the the malice, which is kind of a ill-defined bad thing mm -hmm. that is because uh, corrupting Shatterkin is a danger to uh, them. Uh, I I want to develop more about that last one, but I have not put a lot on paper about it. Based on the way you describe it, I get the feeling that the ma that um on some on some in some levels the malice should be should be the player character's equals. Based on how you describe it, much in the same way certain bo certain boss fights and certain games are designed to be your equal. Mm. Or um, go ahead. I I I I would say it's it's meant to be more than their equal. Like I mean, it's supposed to to outrank them for sure. Uh, a single malice infected Shatterkin is going to be uh, a, a challenge that all the players are going to be having to team up and fight their hardest to to deal with. Yeah, and what I'm what I mean by your equal is is not 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 necessarily in in tier, but more of more of um, utilizing the same the same tricks as you as you might. Um, a buddy of Ooh. mine once described once described the ideal boss fight as. A better version of you, and okay, I see the malice kind of, kind of, fall, kind of falling in, kind of falling into that kind of thing. Okay, I can see that. So, so whereas, like, oh, you know, you might play it with the, these other factions, like the syndicates, that they might be kind of predictable. Like, oh yeah, the the spire is always going to be just kind of big dumb thugs that are trying to weaponize the shatterkin. Whereas something that's with the malice. It, it's unpredictable as a player is, and it, it it's gonna, it's not just gonna do the default send in its thugs and 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 be easily outwitted. It's gonna take a lot more to deal with. Yeah, um, if I have to use if I have to okay. use if I have to use less boss like examples, um, something that instantly comes to mind is Nemesis T type from Resident Evil Three. Uh -huh. You know, you see, you see him, you see him show up. It's time, it's time to start running the other way. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and that, that's that's the feeling I want the malice to to convey when it comes in. The game is the players need to learn quickly that this is not something that we just rush into a fight against. This is not the uh, just another goon to 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 defeat. It's it's a. Uh, it's 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 as smart or smarter than you, and it's going to to it's not going to stop. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the concept of evolution within Sh within Shatterkin, this idea this idea of a of a share of a shared evolution drive clock, um, I'm curious how that how that developed into the form that it that it takes, and what some of the challenges were with trying to with trying to have a system of evolution. Within the within the game. Challenges here. Um, I think the first thing to say is is about why why it's a shared evolution clock rather than individual is just um, I wanted to make sure that everybody got to be awesome at the same time. Um, if you're watching a TV show like Digimon, it's okay if only one character per per episode gets to be cool uh, and get their big evolution. Um, uh, because it's just a show you're watching, uh, you're invested in the whole story rather than the character you're controlling. Cause, cause you're watching the show. You're not controlling the character, but in the game it's, well, no, no, I'm, I'm playing and I want to see my character do cool things. And, and that's not to say that, you know, we can't take turns in an RPG that we can't say that uh, I'll, I'll let somebody else have the spotlight for sure. Uh, that, that we can, uh, but I felt like with this being like at the core of the game, I wanted it to be a, a shared group experience that everybody got to do um, at the same time. So, so everybody evolves at the same time, and everybody's experiences contribute to that evolution. Mm -hmm. um, challenges that I've met, though, as we've as as de developing this, is figuring out what's the right formula to decide when you evolve what what fills that evolution gauge and and how much does it need uh and at what rate should we be evolving uh because role-playing games you know just being an analog form of gaming rather than a video game that can do stuff quickly uh it takes time and so you, if you can 
if it, if it takes too long, then like, you know, you're playing a three to four hour session and only evolving once, uh, gets to be not enough when you've got these higher level evolutions. Right. So, mm -hmm. so figuring out what it takes to evolve was, was a big deal. Um, and I settled too with the, the higher evolutions that once you've unlocked a certain amount of evolutions, you start to evolve two steps at a time. Um, because just so that we don't have to fill that gauge four times to be max level <laughs> in a fight. Um, Although, you know, now that I say that, I don't remember if I wrote that into the rules or just played it that way. Probably a little huh. of column A and probably a little of column B. Probably. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, oh, yeah, I wrote this game and, and I, I, I made it. It's from my brain. And at the same time, I've not gone back and reread the whole thing very often often so uh sometimes i don't know what's in my game mm -hmm. uh you know so um but i i i i tweaked the evolution requirements a few times uh thus far like it, at first it was just when you do a desperate action uh but then the problem was it's like okay if you're if you're familiar with the fortune of the dark games where there's uh, a controlled, risky, or desperate action mm -hmm. determining like, how dangerous what you're doing is going to be. Uh, if everybody wants to evolve, then they're doing desperate actions only, which is cool, it's fun, it's dangerous, but it also meant that, like, it, it was always desperate. You know, it was... We, it, we might as well have just thrown that other part of the game. Um, whenever you suffer a consequence. Because uh, that makes sense, too, of, like, you know, the Digimon, in Digimon, you know, a lot of times they were evolving in response to the danger that the kids were put in. Um, and so that was, that worked out pretty well. Um, but because they're pretty much just doing desperate actions all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, in my current play test that I'm running right now, I'd actually, I might have dropped that in the latest release of the rules. I don't remember, or if that's coming up next. Uh, so now it's just when you and so far that's worked out all right. It's it's a because it's it's a consequence in 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 the Forge of the Dark system. You know, you can resist any consequence, right? So the gauge is going to go up, and you might not actually have bad things happen because you resisted them. So it's not saying you got to get beaten up before you can evolve. It's just you got to get in danger at risk of getting beaten up. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, it's worked out pretty good. Now, with with that kind of thing in mind, now you've been you've been play testing this thing for a good for a good while. Even got your own theme song for the, for the play test, as I as I noticed on the itch.io page. Yeah. But, um, what were, what have been, what have been some of the, um, some of the more significant, some of the significant lessons that you've, that you've, that you've learned having the, having this in front of a, in front of a semi-controlled group? Hmm. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. There's, there's, there, there definitely are some good lessons I learned. Um, now to be fair, I haven't been play testing it constantly, mm -hmm. um, we did one good playtest campaign back at the end of 2019, um, maybe the beginning of 2020. Uh, and then, of course, this, you may have heard there was a pandemic. Uh, we didn't play for a while. Uh, and so didn't touch it. Didn't I, I mean, during that time, I didn't even really touch the game at all for developing it either. Um, and it's only just in the last couple of months that I'm like, oh, I got to get back to working on that. Actually, you know what? Uh, it's only been the last month, not a couple of months. I, I, I kind of got back into it with a flurry of working on it uh, at the beginning of June and uh, started up this new playtest group. Uh, and and it's uh, been a lot. It's been, it's been good to get back into it for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as things I learned from the playtests, the first playtest, at least, I, I I can look back at with a lot more like, uh, since I saw the whole thing, what were the things that really happened that that I I learned? Um, and I think there were a lot of things I thought were, went right. There were some things that didn't work well. Uh, I I mentioned how I have uh, I'm currently playtesting a variant where 
the kid is controlled by the player and then their shatterkin is controlled by another player. Mm-hmm. That was because one of the biggest problems I felt with the first play test was that the kid and the shatterkin never interacted uh, because it was played by the same person. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really awkward, you know, to have a conversation with yourself you know, anyone that's ever GM'd and had a conversation between two NPCs knows knows how weird it is, and and but you know, or it 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 just rather than doing that weird conversation, the players just kind of push it to the side, and their Shatterkin never talked to their kids, and their kids never talked to their Shatterkin, and the kids just kind of were there in the background while the Shatterkin did everything, mm-hmm. um, and and so that was kind of missing what I wanted. Uh, out of this game it didn't fit the i mean in 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 again the the main inspiration of digimon like the kids still didn't do near as much as what the digimon did but they were they're more active they were they were say you know they were shouting stuff to the digimon as the battles went on and they were they were interacting with them and 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 dealing with them in a lot of meaningful ways and and i really wanted that to be part of the game so uh I I actually brought up that question to a variety of other people uh, in some uh, in some other game design forums, uh, and 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 I got the feedback of from several people. Well, have have them played by other kids or mm-hmm. other kids, other players. None of us are kids. We're all grown ups playing with kids. Uh, <laughs> but the it it was it it solved the problem i think you know having playing we've done i think four sessions three or four sessions of this new play test with this and it's it's so much more engaging of interaction and and to hear here you know we 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 where we're switching around different players taking on the different shatterkin each session like hearing you know kind of a different spin on each one uh depending on who it's through like we we came up with some some basic things of of like what's what kind of voice do they have right so that everyone could kind of kind of do something kind of similar but not not that strictly in it it's just made for some real fun interactions you know of uh whether it's it's silly interactions or meaningful interactions you know and and some of the more meaningful interactions maybe we're playing a little melodramatic on purpose you know like we had uh the other night when we were playing you know a, a moment of like uh because somebody was going to trying to do an action that wasn't they weren't gonna they wanted to get more dice so they took a double dare that's the equivalent of a a devil's bargain in this one um, and uh to, in role playing out that double dare the double dare was that he was gonna push themselves too far and end up like he had like a kind of a a lightning teleport thing he was doing and uh he's like i don't got enough power i don't got enough power it's like you've got to do it i believe in you and and then it like the it got real weird it got real weird because suddenly the kid's shatter kid is like but but dad he starts calling him dad um and it's like i'm gonna go too far it's gonna be dangerous it's, you're gonna be okay you've got to do it i'll come back to you dad i'll come back to you <laughs> and it, it just it got weird and it was fun and it wouldn't have happened if it was all one, all the same player. Mm. Um, and so, so that's been, that's been just bundles of fun. Uh, another thing that I learned from the, the, t- from the play tests, uh, and that I'm still trying to figure out the solution to is I had created this system for, you know, because I was kind of trying to make it like a mission based system, like, how blaze in the dark has your scores that you go on mm-hmm. and this one there's crisis crises that would come up and and each crisis was like a score that you would do in blaze in the dark but instead this is a, a crisis you're responding to and i built some mechanics around it of, of your uh how vigilant did, were you in watching for crises and how urgent were the crises and and it 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 built up too fast created like too much stress for the theme of the game uh rather you know it it took away some of the fun of kids 
playing with their cool evolving monsters when it was like oh man we've got to pick between like a half dozen crises to respond to we're not going to get to all of them bad stuff's going to happen which well i love it when a kid's show is willing to show that sometimes bad stuff just happens you don't want it to be the only thing that happens Mm -hmm. you know uh and so i and and it also kind of made for an awkward like format it it it, may, it it was getting too structured so they didn't feel like they had enough time to play around uh, it was it was getting too much into just the oh here's a crisis go fight win mm-hmm. um and so we're, we're we're playing around in our current play test with with a little bit more of a uh of a free form structure and uh i don't know yet how it's going to play out mm-hmm. uh because we we uh haven't done much with it yet but i'll I'm um, hoping it turns out good. Uh, and, and in the end, I might just take the whole crisis system and the, the vigilance and the urgency and, and throw them out uh, if this works out better without them. Mm-hmm. Um, now, since, since, you, since you mentioned that, given how you mentioned that you hope that it turns out right, um, in, lieu, in lieu of jinxing, because... Much in the much in the same much in the same way that the saying goes that there are no atheists in foxholes, there are there are no atheists at the dice table. <laughs> um, it may just be uh, praying to the god of dice. Yeah, the unfortunate problem is, is that um, the dice gods are a mo- are a model version are, are a model of equality that I think we can all aspire to because it does not matter your age, occupation, political alignment. Race, sex, sexual orientation, height, weight, income, the dice gods hate you. <laughs> they do. It is a they are cold and heartless gods I'd who actually, look on us with disdain. I'd actually compare them to Krom from Conan's universe. No one yeah? pray, no one prays to Krom. They they use his name as an expletive at best. Yeah. The one thing you don't want to get is the attention of Krom and his devils. Yeah, um, absolutely. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, since you mentioned that 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 um that is that yeah. that's something that you're working on, um, would you be would you be expanding what would be on the kid side of the she, of the sheet so that so that um so that there's a good so that there's a good variety of things for them to do. Yeah. I, yeah, I would definitely like to. Um, uh, I the kid sheet that I currently have developed uh, again. I haven't released it yet, but uh, it, it has already added a little bit more in that it, it kind of builds up a little bit of uh, or has space to write more about what your what your rights and wrongs amount to in your character, so that it's not just oh I have uh, my character has hope uh, as well as uh, anger and. And leave it at that. It's you write out a little bit about it, right? So you know, okay, well, I've got anger. Well, how does that anger manifest? Well, oh, it's it's uh, anger because I'm I'm kind of small and I don't want people. You know, I got I got a I'm quick to anger because people have picked on me a little bit or something like that. You know, it starts to develop a little more. So that's helped build up the character. But um, I also added in a a, a mechanical feature uh, called peril. Uh, peril is a replacement for harm uh for your kids Mm -hmm. uh the kid characters whenever they would suffer a consequence because they're off doing their own thing um any consequence boils down to how much peril they get well not any consequence you can have other narrative things but rather than taking harm um from anything they'll just fill in some peril and when your peril gauge is filled then it forces your Shatterkin or another Shatterkin, if your Shatterkin's not around, to come in and protect them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it might be that, you know, your it, it, it might be fine. Like, it might, your, your Shatterkin might be totally capable of coming in there and protecting the kid in that situation. But it might also get you into trouble. Because what if it's because the kids are trying to sneak around and they can't let people know about their Shatterkin right now. Uh, mm-hmm. But then because they get into too much peril, their Shatterkin is is compelled to to intervene. And now the bad guy knows they've got Shatterkin. Um, so it can create some narrative problems. It might also be that their Shatterkin was holding back because 
he didn't have trust to, to spare, but if they're forced to jump in and protect, they might uh, invest too much trust and 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 get the equivalent of a what the, what what in Blades of the Dark was a trauma for filling up your stress. Mm -hmm. um, so having that potential consequence uh, for your characters that's separate from just the consequences baked into the the rest of the mechanics. Uh, so far, from what I've seen in playtesting it with these rules, has made it a little easier for the the kid characters to get more involved because they're no longer sitting outside of the rules. Mm -hmm. They have rules that work now, I guess. Yeah. Now, and that brings me to an, to another question with the, with that with that separation in mind. Would you be leaning for a universal? Um, Universal kid sheet, or would or would you be creating a set of um, kid centered playbooks? Um, so I, I I think I've thought about that for sure. Of like, do I want to make full playbooks where the kids now have abilities, uh, and and those playbooks are built around like archetypes of some sort? Um, and I haven't I haven't taken that step. No, uh, right now they still just have the same set of actions and they're going to mirror what's on your Shatterkin. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go that route. I'm not going to rule it out, but at this time, uh, a universal kid sheet. I, I did, as far as like the design of them, I did theme them after I, I made five different ones themed uh, after each of the different Shatterkin types, just because I'm, I'm I'm in love with the way I designed them because I'm and you narcissist. probably like parallels as much as any other writer does. Yeah, you know. So so rather you know so I've got I've got I pulled them up in front of me on my computer here and I can see like I've got one that's designed for the kid that has the beast type Shatterkin mm -hmm. and one for the kid that's got the Saurian type Shatterkin. Yeah, and with those kind of things, it would be interesting to mix and to mix and match. Have 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 them with with um, types that don't that aren't exactly complementary of each other. Could be um, mechanically right now the cheats mean nothing different, um, mm -hmm. but I can see there being some fun ways to play around with that for sure. Yeah. Um, now with with that in with that in mind, um, do you have do you have a release window for the next update on the on um, the Shatterkin? core book well i um i have a, a a goal that i've set for myself i don't know uh are you asking just like the next update or the actual like pushing it out of early access and into it is now released the next update because Any parts that uh, are affected by this, and this is a, a pretty big change. So, so it's definitely um, got more impact throughout the entire document. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it is uh, it is coming together all right, uh, and so hopefully by the end of the month. So this is the time of recording here. This is July. Uh, I'm hoping by the end of July. Uh, we'll see if I live up to that or not. I uh, I hope to. I've I've uh, I've not been consistent though. That's for sure. Do I have to knock on wood again? Screw you it. might. You might want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, now now it's on recording. I, I have to meet my goal here. So, <laughs> well played. What? What? If? You, what? Are you thinking that if you don't, you're going to never hear the end of it from me? I, I I'll, I'll have you know hordes of 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 rabid fans knocking at my door uh, in 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 anger and frustration. <laughs> I'm certain. Oh. Well, who who knows? Maybe who knows? Maybe one maybe one of them will pull it. Will pull a uh, Mass Effect and send and send you and send you six hundred cupcakes that all taste the same. That would be. Um, 
I mean, at least I'd have a lot of cupcakes. But with, but with all that said, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it well evolves. If you'll par if you'll par if you'll pardon the if you'll pardon the bit of um, wordplay on my end. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And all puns are pardoned. Yeah. And I do want to give my I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. I appreciate it. This was uh, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to have been on the show. This is this has been fun talking with you and and, and exciting to share more about this game, uh, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh man, I didn't drink at all. Ah, oh, butts. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate it. I, I'd, I'd be happy to return sometime uh, if you ever care to hear more. Yeah. Uh, but this was this was a lot of fun, um, and uh, and uh, I yeah, yeah, yep. And with and as well as well, um, I'd like to give a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy, and enjoy the insanity that we'd go about here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!